Next question is from Riley Kavanaugh 2. Did you have a business plan when you started Mind Pump that identified how you would like to grow your revenue? For instance, did you have a plan on how much you wanted to receive in advertising, map sales, and merchandise? Well, I love questions like this. Yeah, I figured question. you would. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, you, oh, this is an Adam you know what's interesting about this is that uh, and I'm going to speak to one of the biggest, and this is all, you know, of course, hindsight, right? Every time you, you have a business that succeeds, you can look back and see what worked and what didn't work. But what's interesting about this one, and I see a lot of people having problems or, or challenges, I should say, with this aspect, is people tend to want to plan everything out yeah. perfectly before they take the first step. They want to have this elaborate business plan. How are we going to do this? How are we going to do that? Let's do this, let's do that. And that's you know, there's a term for that. They call it uh, paralysis by, by analysis. analysis. Now, there's nothing wrong with planning, but... You know, and we we did talk and plan, but really what we did was we we stepped forward and just did, we it. did it. And yeah. as the market responded, as the audience responded, as we started to see what worked and what didn't work, because those things are impossible to predict, we would mold and shift and shape the business. One thing was for sure, we started the podcast thinking to ourselves uh, initially, let's grow an audience and let's have some authority and let's provide lots of value. That was the most important thing that we, the most important thing that we put at the top mm -hmm. when we first started. It wasn't until about a year later that we really started to talk about monetizing, but it was only because we had already provided so much value that no joke, we would get messages and DMs and emails from people asking us, do you have a program? Do you have a product? Is there something I can... I can buy or invest in to support my income. And that was when we really made the decision to, to start to monetize. Yeah, I think too, like, um, I would like to call ours an iterative approach. And so like, it was all about action in the beginning, but we've tried really hard to refine this process and get better in terms of organization and, and where, you know, everything's going to be direct. And I know Adam could speak to this like a, a lot more here in a minute, but um, that was like the initial bit is is to not be afraid to pull the trigger just to get things started. And then you start to understand, uh, you know, what it really takes to, to get things moving in that direction and then start cutting where you need to cut, start refining and fine tuning things as you go. I think that's just, uh, you know, for people that really plan and are organized, this is like nails on a chalkboard. And I, I get into fights <laughs> with this with, with people that I've worked with in the past all the time because – like in my opinion, I I would actually like to, to put it out there. I, I would love to see somebody's business plan that actually like fell, followed to the T of like what they're trying to set does. forth. Never. I don't think that's ever happened in the history of business. No. So it's it, it's great to put down ideas, and I, I look at that as an idea. Okay, here's an idea, and here's where I'm I'm centering uh, my focus in terms of like what I'm trying to accomplish. But you got to know right away you're going to be throwing that right out the window. Yeah. Timing in business is everything. There there is tons of brilliant ideas that are poorly timed and never get off the ground, and there's plenty of stupid ideas timed very well that explode. So when we started this. There was a there was a huge need in the space, and the market was ripe for it. The podcasting medium was growing rapidly. It was at that time becoming one of the better places to. It was just starting to become popular with advertising, and we looked at all the trends. We saw year over year the growth of it. We saw the direction of digital streaming media and where it was going. It was obvious that this this was going to kind of replace radio in the future and we all knew that like there there was a, we talk a lot of times about the, the luck of the business and that we didn't have a plan but you know no one at all disagreed with that yeah, we man. all looked at that and all said absolutely this is where this is going yeah. and then we we did our our market research which was listening to as many fitness type podcasts that were out there and nobody was presenting the message that we believed needed to be presented so we filled a need. We filled a need at the perfect time. And we were terrible. We were raw. But we we saw the opportunity. And, be, and along the way, we have reiterated, like Justin is alluding to, the overall business plan. Now, we are way more methodical and way more strategic about how we move forward. In fact, we have a, you know, a three, a five, and a 10-year plan from here right now. But when we first started, it really was just that. And then what we did that I thought was great and that I think that it worked because we're all on the same page is like 
nobody got into it with this idea, okay, we're going to build this business and then we're going to charge this much. We're going to make this much. We really first just wanted to prove that we were right about the first part, which mm -hmm. is, is it the right time? And do the, does the market need this? So let's put it out there. Let's see if, let's see if the market responds and we are right about that. And then we'll figure out how we're going to make money, how we're going to scale and how we're going to do all these other things. And so we took off and, you know, the audience growing organically was our feedback that, okay, I think we have something here. And then to Sal's point, when it, we knew it was time to monetize, when people were literally trying to give us money, we were getting, each of us were getting several DMs a day and emails of people that we had already impacted their lives so much that they felt compelled to give us money. And that's when every one of us looked at, okay, it's time. We have a real business on our hands. And then it began. And then into the uh, question about, uh, you know, advertising, I love talking about this because you, you want to, you want to know something right now. There is great timing in that right now. It's a, it's the wild, wild west in podcast advertising. There's this bullshit CPM number that somebody posted on, online somewhere or created out of thin air that all these podcasters just fall right into suit and just agree to. And you have all these companies that are getting savvy to, oh, wow, podcasting mediums are a great place to advertise. And then they go and they just pluck all these micro influencers, give them some bullshit CPM uh, that they pay them. And then they they make all kinds of money off of it. And they're asking for two, three X their ROI. And, you know, because we did this and we had the idea of, okay, we are going to provide a product ourselves. We don't need money from anybody else. It can grow slowly organically because we had other things on the side. We allowed it to do that. And it also allowed us to not have to go mm. looking for money anywhere else and to be very picky about who we work with. And then even when we decided to start working with people, we set the terms. Listen, we like your product. You like what we're talking don't about. Don't tell us how to talk about it. That's don't right. tell us what to say. That's right. Yeah, it's got to be authentic. All these things we we negotiated early on. And of course it was a, a little hard at the beginning, you know. Boy, did we probably come off really cocky and arrogant to tell these people that are trying to give us money, <laughs> "No, this is how we're going to do things." And you know, we definitely probably rubbed some people the wrong way and we probably yeah, did for we probably didn't get some sponsors because of things like that, but eventually you know, once we found companies that we worked really well with, we proved, we showed the numbers, then it was really easy. And now we're in a position where we are capable to turn away a lot of brands and really hand select the, the play. And we court them for like six months. We, we talk or we meet or have lunch with the CEOs. We want to know everything about them. And then we want them to know us and like all about what our vision is. And, and now we are able to partner up with brands like that. And so, yeah, man, I, I, there wasn't a lot of, no one sat down and drew up a formal, you know, business plan like we all learned in school and we didn't sit there and, you know, double like, oh, we're going to go this way and that way. Yeah, it was definitely prove that, that there is a need in the market and prove that the timing is right in the market for what we have to offer. If that, if both those prove to be true, we have something here you and know, then we start formulating. You know, again, looking back, we were generally, and we still are, extremely flexible with what this is going to look like. But there are a few things that were extremely inflexible in, and and that's what, that was our plan. The plan, non negotiables. Yeah. The plan was when we first started this was, and these are the things that have not changed, and they're they they won't change. One of them is we want to provide tremendous positive value for fitness and health for the average person. We want to help people in real impactful ways. We want to counter the terrible, you know, crap information in the fitness and health space. As trainers, this was very frustrating for us watching clients, you know, try trend after trend after trend to try to get themselves healthier only to fail each time, only to become, you know, more disenfranchised and and and, and lose their 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 zest for continuing to help themselves. We saw that we wanted to counter that. So that's really, and we also want to do this in a very real way because, you know, luckily for us, we all started this as grown men and none of us would, would have trade, uh, traded who we were for any amount of money. I, I think we got to the point where we mature enough and realized, look, I don't care how much you pay me. If I have to be fake to earn that, it's not worth it. So those things were not flexible, hard, set in stone. How we accomplish that, very flexible. If it's the podcast, wonderful. If it's written content, awesome. If it's how we deliver the, our information and we need to deliver it one way or another, totally flexible. I'll totally change that as long as it accomplishes 
those goals that are that are set in stone. So I think that's important if you start a business, say to yourself, what am I willing to be flexible on and what is hard for me? What is something that I won't be flexible on and then move forward with that? I want to share one more thing related to this question uh, because I see it a lot and it's um – it's way off what people think. I was way off uh, originally when I the, the first three attempts that I had at starting an apparel line. And, you know, people always ask that, you know, we, the, Mind Pump has several streams of income and, we, you know, and merchandise is one of those. But it is so insignificant compared to everything else that we don't even pay attention to it. I, if you were to ask Justin, Sal, and Doug right now what we did in, in apparel sales the last three months, I guarantee they wouldn't even know what the number is. Yeah. What's that, apparel? Yeah, so I feel like but, we give it for free. But it's yeah. the most it's the most popular thing that people in the fitness space tend to do is they they gain a little popularity on Instagram or YouTube or whatever it is, and then they they just want to start this clothing line. Mm. And the margins are terrible, and everybody who tells you they would wear your clothes never does. Yeah. And they and they <laughs> yeah. and they all want it for free or for cheaper. So there's like no money in it. We literally look at the merchant. I don't need any more t-shirts. Yeah. We literally look at the merchandise side of the business as advertising for ourselves. So as long as we don't lose on it and it at least like pays for the people that take care of all the packaging, the shipping, the creating all the shirts, the storing it and all the crap and keeping the, as long as it pays for itself and covers us being able to give away our free shirts every week, that we consider it successful. But in reality, the, that thing makes us no money. It wouldn't put gas in fucking Doug's car. It was not. It is not a profitable way to build a business. And if so, if you're listening and you're an aspiring entrepreneur, and you see a lot, and you see so much of it on social media, these influencers that get popularity, and then they want to start a clothing line. And and then they 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 pretend like they're making so much money, showing pictures of their car and you know all the boxes they're shipping out and stuff like that. We ship tons of boxes every single day, and it's terrible profit. It's a terrible amount of money, mm -hmm. and it's a terrible business idea unless you have got some great you know designer fashion background, You're a fashionista right? And yeah. you may be the next Ralph Lauren or Calvin Klein. Then by all means, or do Hugo your boss, do your thing. That's but if, everybody that starts a t-shirt. Right, yeah. yeah. But if you think That's you're, me. if you think you're going to buy t-shirts from China and logo flip and or put your brand on a t-shirt and you're going to get rich doing that, good luck. Yeah, very very hard.